All right, let's open our Bibles again uh, to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Last time we read verses 14 through 18. We only made comments as far as verse 15. So Hebrews chapter 2. Let me read verses 14 and 15 again. And um, for the sake of the, the uh, website, this will be Hebrews 2 verses 16 through 18 if you are keeping track. But let me read back up and read verses 14 and 15 again. It says there, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, that's Christ, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Christ came into the world to deliver men from the fear and power of death. In order to do this, uh, he had to become partaker of, that is notice, flesh and blood, there in verse 14. Um, the Christians should pay close attention to the wording here. Since Christ's, excuse me, Christ's resurrection body is no longer human. And it's in the strict sense. Let's see if I can't explain myself. Um, it's only flesh and bones. Go back, if you will, to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. Luke 24, notice there, verse 39. Here Christ in the resurrected body appearing to his disciples again. Luke 24, verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. Uh, no blood is mentioned there. Uh, his blood had already been shed on the cross of Calvary. Also, go, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, begin there at verse 50. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Verse 54, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Uh, no blood in your resurrected body either. Pay attention to that. Go forward just a little farther to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Ephesians, chapter 5. Start there, verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. This will have to, this will have to be um, paired together with what John writes in 1 John 3, 
Verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Um, and we read, For the earnest expectation of the creature, that's you, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Romans 8, verse 19. So God says that you and I, as members of his church, here in Ephesians um, 5, 29, he declares you and I as being part of his flesh and of his bones. That is the description of the glorified a resurrected body of Christ and the promised resurrected body of believers. We just don't see it all yet. The promise is there and it's guaranteed to us by trusting in Christ. We just haven't seen it all um, take place yet. We're waiting to see it take place. And uh, one day at the catching up of all Christians, uh, all believers, uh, past and present, will then be changed and made into immortal and incorruptible form of flesh and bones as the body of Christ is now. Flesh and blood, however, is an entirely um, human uh, combination. And it's the, uh, the resurrected body of Christ um, and you as a believer is described much like the body of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And you needn't turn, but he said of his wife, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Genesis, Genesis uh, 3 or 2, verse 23. This is before they sinned, before they took part of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and something happened to them. You know, it's a. I did a whole Bible study on this very subject um, several years ago. And it's a fascinating thing to consider the prospect that Adam and his wife may have received the blood, their blood, from eating of the forbidden tree. And uh, the only other tree that is forbidden anywhere else in the Bible is a grape tree or a grapevine. Uh, it's forbidden to the Nazarites. They were not to eat it. They were supposed to separate themselves from anything that came from a vine or a vine tree, as the Bible calls it. So a grape vine, although it's small, we don't think of it as a tree, it's nevertheless counted among trees in the Bible. And uh, grapes are an interesting type of fruit in that the juice of the grape is also referred to as the blood of the grape in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1. And Christ took the cup of wine and said, this is now, this is uh, the blood of the New Testament, New Covenant, my flesh. And the changing of elements, perhaps from of water, in their circulatory system to now blood, which is a possibility. You no, know, water is a necessary component of all life. Everything living depends on water uh, in some way. But, and your body is mostly made up of water and moisture. About 80, 85 percent of your body is classified as water, moisture. And when Moses, one of the first miracles Moses carried out in the book of Exodus was to turn the waters of Egypt into blood. And one of the first miracles Christ performed, John chapter 2, was the wedding of Cana, where he turned water into wine, a type of blood. And all of those things put together seem to paint a picture and there's no actual single verse that tells you this is exactly what happened. I'll grant you that. But um, a conjecture would suggest that all of these verses together indicate that before the man and the woman sinned, 
they had water in their circulatory system. And once they sinned, that water turned into wine or turned into blood. And uh, when Christ was resurrected, his blood already been spilled on the cross of Calvary. His glorified body is now described as flesh and bones. No need for blood any longer. He was alive without the need for blood uh, circulating through every capillary and every part of his body. And thus, so will you be. Do I fully understand all the aspects, all the ramifications of that uh, suggestion? No. Uh, can you fully wrap your mind around all of it? Probably not. But can you still believe it? Yeah. It's, you can still believe it, even if you don't fully understand every element, every possible uh, detail that it, that it touches upon. But um, a body of flesh and blood is strictly a human combination. Verse, verse 16, back in our text, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. If he had done that, he would have come down to us only as a spirit. As it says back there in chapter 1, verse 7, And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. It says, But he took on him the seed of Abraham. So he came down to the world as a man in the flesh, since um, Mary, who was a descendant of Abraham, was flesh and blood. Christ was also said to be of the seed of King David, but only according to the flesh. Romans 1, verse 3, quote, Concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. You know, Christ's real lineage was God. He was God's seed. According to Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So the, the promise of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ was seen as far back as Genesis 3, verse 15, in the garden. After the sin, uh, God told the serpent that the seed of the woman would one day arise and crush the seed of the Satan. And Christ was that seed. As a matter of fact, um, he's referred to as the God's holy child, Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verse 27. He, is, he was the seed of God implanted into the womb of the Virgin Mary, thus be born of a virgin, and thus also possessing two natures simultaneously, uh, both human and divine. And this is called the mystery of godliness, according to 1 Timothy 3.16. Somehow God was manifest in the flesh. God came into the world and lived in human form. How do we wrap our minds around that? I don't know. And yet, that is, ne un that is nevertheless the necessary understanding of Jesus Christ. To say that Jesus Christ came into the world only as a man, some sort of um, elevated spiritual guru, some spiritual um, leader with the great philosophy of life, is to underestimate, to downgrade, downplay the virtue and the deity and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was so far beyond any earthly uh, philosopher, or any earthly religious figure that's ever existed or ever will exist. As, as a matter of fact, if you were to put all of the greatest, so-called greatest thinkers uh, and their beliefs together, not a single one of them, uh, or, or rather co co collectively, they couldn't stand up against the, the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. I met a Roman Catholic priest the other day at, at work. I met him actually about a month ago. We had called him to officiate a funeral. And I've been doing this business for... Uh, for the most part, for the most of the last uh, 32 years. And this was the very first Catholic priest who I've ever met who actually brings a Bible with him. 
There's a Ryrie Study Bible that says, as a matter of fact. No American st uh, standard text, but R the Ryrie Study Bible, which are fairly conservative uh, Bible study notes. And he rode in the funeral car with me, and I had a pretty good uh, visit with him, and I told him, you know, you're polite, and you, I, I don't consider him to be my spiritual father, but that's the title, and I said, Father, you're the, I have to be honest with you, you're the very first priest I've ever met who actually carries a Bible with him and read from it during the service. And he said, oh, really? I thought all priests, I said, no, no, they don't. <laughs> Trust me. And, and this man was quoting scripture to me. Um, he, had, he says, I read it every day. And um, he said, I, I can't understand how so many Catholic priests say they believe in the scriptures and they believe in Christ, but they never read the Bible. And um, which stunned me because I've I've met hundreds of Catholic priests. I've talked to them as they ride in the car with me. I've had small uh, private conversations with them. And um, but he said uh, I have to believe that most Roman Catholic priests don't have a real personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And actually had very good fellowship with him in the car. So, you know, in Pastor Schreib's humble opinion and judgment, I think I met a Catholic priest who believes in the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the same way that I do, apart from the <clears throat> Catholic doctrines and the Catholic dogmas and the transubstantiation and the so-called powers of the priest and the Virgin Mary and all of the things that are sort of cloud the issue of Jesus Christ for most Roman Catholic church members. And he, like I said, he was quoting scripture back to me that uh, sent common verses that he and I both agreed upon. And I said to him, all right, in fact, he said, I, I, I've told Catholic priests, friends of mine, that why don't you, instead of using simply philosophy that we're taught in seminary, uh, and then say, well, these are difficult problems, we don't know what the answers to this question or that question might be, why don't you start reading your Bible? Maybe God will show you what the answers to life's problems ought to be. And um, I said, you know, they said of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, Luke chapter 4, in the synagogue, after he read the text from Isaiah, and he, he knew which passage I was referring to. He said, it says, they, they wondered at him and marveled at him and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of Christ's mouth. I said, and, and he quoted to me, uh, John chapter 6, Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And I said, you know, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, talked about a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the winds came and the floods came and the rain descended and beat upon that house and it fell not because it was founded upon a rock. And he said, whosoever doeth these sayings of mine, the same shall be likened to a wise man. And it says afterwards, they all marveled at him, and for he taught them. As one having authority, and not as the scribes. And the priest was still sitting in the car with him. He was getting excited at what I was saying. And I said, they sent officers to arrest the Lord Jesus. They came back empty-handed. The Jews asked, why have you not brought him? And they answered, Never a man spake like this man. And I said, um, Christ had thousands of people following him on foot every day to hear what he would say next. Hanging on every word he uttered. And my point is, the wisdom and the virtue 
and the graciousness and the power and the magnificence of the Lord Jesus Christ cannot be matched by any earthly man or any earthly philosophy. All the philosophies in the world combined could not rival what Jesus Christ offers to the sinner. Somebody said amen to that. Apparently it wasn't you, but somebody did. <laughs> and um, we can edit that out of the video too if you want to. <laughs> I don't mean to insult my audience while I'm speaking to them. <laughs> By the way, it's just a side note, we'll edit this out too. John Davis in uh, England, who's another Bible-believing uh, Rukmanite, that guy's more of a Rukmanite than we are. It took an a American preacher to help an um, Englishman uh, rediscover his own Bible. Right? That's sort of the way I see his relationship. But uh, he was jealous of me when I emailed him once and told him that I was taught the Bible by Dr. Ruckman. He was jealous of me. But I was listening to a CD of one of his sermons, and he's... And right in the middle of his sermon, somebody's cell phone goes off, and you can hear it on the, the audio. And uh, this pastor, he says, you know, it's always some moron who has his phone turned on. You know, he just calls his church member a moron right there in the middle of the sermon. <laughs> uh, that's funny, right? You can say that in England. Apparently, they don't get offended at you. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't attempt such a thing. And, uh, but... But the Lord Jesus Christ is so much greater than all the, all the approaches to God, all the philosophies, all the ideas of men. You know, um, let me digress just for another moment. I've been studying uh, Buddhism and the history of Buddhism because I'm working on a book called A Bible Believer's Guide to Buddhism. And I don't know if I'll finish it, or the Lord will allow me to finish it uh, within the next uh, six months or so, but hopefully. And uh, there's very little evidence that the so-called Buddha even existed. Very, very little. It's all been mythology created after the Gospel of Christ reached India and China. <clears throat> The very first biography of the Buddha wasn't written until 100 years A.D. And they claim that he lived 560 years B.C. That's several centuries to go by. Um, and nothing written about this guy or his so-called teachings. But it's only after gospel, the, uh, the Apostle Thomas uh, took the gospel to India about 49 A.D. And then from there it spread into China about 100, 200, 300, 400 um, AD, that the story of the Buddha began to be created. And of course, from that, uh, or those origins, it spread into all the other um, uh, Asian countries, Vietnam, Laos, uh, Cambodia, and other places, Korea, and so forth. But the Buddha's philosophy was called the Middle Way. The Middle Way is a supposedly he struggled to find the, the answers to the universe, the answers to life's problems. How does man overcome suffering in this life so that this life is bearable? And so he sat and he meditated, he starved himself, and he afflicted his own flesh, hoping that some great light would come to him. And the great revelation that he uh, said he happened upon was what he called the middle way, a way of perfect balance. Don't be too extreme trying to do good because eventually you're, you'll fail somewhere along the way. And certainly nobody wants you to do bad all the time because that wouldn't be any good. So try to live your life right in the middle. And uh, Dennis Prager, who I respect greatly, although he wasn't trying to comment on Buddhism, he had sort of a similar take on it. He said, how about for every criticism you give, why not give a compliment to the next person? That way you sort of even it out and start all over again. And um, at first, it sounds like a great proposition. That, that's a good suggestion. Sort of, you know, balance out your own thought, your own conscience. 
A better approach would be to go and apologize to that first person you criticized and try to be reconciled to them and say, you know, I'm sorry if I have hurt you and offended you. That would be a much better approach than doing good to the next guy. But the, but the middle way, if you're going to be strict and rigid and follow it, means that for every good thing I do, now I have permission to do a bad thing, just to stay in balance, right? As a matter of fact, I would be required to do a bad thing, which is equally bad uh, to the, in proportion to the amount of good I just did, in order to stay perfectly balanced. A lot of people who sort of interpret the will of God uh, this way, or God's going to judge me for the amount of good I did, but the middle way, you know, you can only go so far with that philosophy. H how, much, how much would a wife love her husband if he said, I only love you every other day, and I hate you the, op the alternating days? Or if a guy only tells the truth half of the time, would we consider him to be an honest man? No. We want people who uh, try to tell the truth all the time. We want people who are honest all the time. A uh, husband or wife, they want their spouse to love them all the time, not just, you know, 50% of the time. That doesn't make for much happiness in life. And so it, the whole idea of the middle way breaks down very quickly when you put it in those terms. A lot of sinners have the idea that, and I said to this, I said this to you, I think, Last week, perhaps. Imagine a guy that's 35, 40 years old. He hasn't been out breaking the law. He has never been arrested or thrown in jail. But he's just lived for himself. Let's see if how much promotion I can get, how much pay I can um, get, or how much income I can accumulate, how many good things I can possess and own for myself. And he's basically lived to satisfy his own wants. He gets to that point in life, 35, 40 years old, and something says to him, you know, maybe you should try to do good for others. Don't live only for yourself. So he, and he's convinced, well, maybe God's going to judge me on the amount of good I do. So I better start doing more good than I've been doing. You're never going to catch up. You're already 35 years behind. You've got 35, 40 years to catch up. And you and I know you'll never be able to undo the 35 or 40 years of self-centered living uh, that you were engaged in with good. You might die five years later. You won't even have enough time to catch up. And so that, that idea falls apart. But what's offered by the Lord Jesus Christ was so far beyond any philosophy of man or any of man's attempts to please God or impress God. Uh, now back to verse 17 in our text. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him, that's Old English, meaning it, it suited him, or it was becoming of him, quote, to be made like unto his brethren. Now, in this case, it would be the literal, physical Hebrews who were descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in the context of verse 14, just before it, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, the brethren could refer to anyone in the flesh, Jew or Gentile. And then it goes on and says that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Note how the word people here is used, much as in Matthew 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. But since all people um, are sinners and they all need to be reconciled to God, the application goes much farther than simply the Jews. It has to extend to Jews and Gentiles as well. And according to verse 17, our high priest is both merciful and faithful when it comes to the things pertaining to God. Um, you know, he's completely unlike the mortal, weak high priests uh, in ancient Israel. He was completely unlike uh, Pope Pius XII, 
sometimes referred to as Hitler's Pope during World War II. He celebrated Hitler's birthday every year at the Vatican during those years. Uh, he was completely unlike um, that Pope or the one at once uh, at the same time before or after who rejoiced because the Catholic uh, Croatians uh, murdered 200,000 uh, Greek Orthodox Serbians during World War II. If you look at Jack Chick's book, or Chick Publications book, Smoke Screens, you'll see pictures on the left side of the page of a Catholic priest in his collar and cassock, and next to it, a picture of him wearing a Nazi uniform that he, he traded uh, his, his Catholic suit in for a Nazi uniform so he could take up arms to go and fight against the Greek Orthodox in Yugoslavia during those years. Pope Paul VI in the 1960s promoted um, communism in Latin America. I forget what they call that. They call it the um, oh, not the social not the social gospel, but um, liberation theology. That somehow uh, communism was a, a worthwhile goal to overthrow the idea of somebody at the top who's making profit off of everybody. You know, dictatorships in South America, Latin America, just pretty common. And, um, and yet they all belong ostensibly to the same religion because they're baptized into the religion by their parents when they're born. And in some countries where only Catholicism is allowed by law, other, all the others are excluded or prohibited then that one religion, that one faith, seems to have sway in, and works its way into every facet of everyone's lives. The Dark Age popes who um, would fornicate with their own family members um, and fornicate with women, married and single, with Catholic nuns. And Martin Luther, in the 1500s, made a trip as still a Catholic priest made a trip to Rome, Italy, to the Vatican on behalf of his order. And off in the distance, he saw the city and he said, Holy Rome, I salute thee. And after he got there and he began learning about the, the stories of Pope Joan from the 800s, supposed the story of a woman who was masquerading herself as a man, and uh, they didn't even discover that she was a man until she went into labor during some formal church procession. And scandal ensued. And they tried to cover that up for, for many, many years. Now they just pass it off. Well, that's just sort of a folklore. That was a fictional tale. It really didn't exist. And yet Martin Luther uh, understood it to have been a true story in the 1500s. And he learned about the priests committing... Um, or performing mass while drunk and committing fornication with women throughout the city. There was one pope who had, who had fathered bastard children all over the city of Rome, dozens of them. And all this is, is uh, conceded to in the old Catholic encyclopedia. So it's not something, it's just a Protestant legend or a Protestant charge. It's actually conceded to and admitted to in old Catholic encyclopedias, about 1917 edition. But our high priest is uh, faithful and he's merciful. I'm glad that God's merciful with me because I certainly need it. And uh, if the truth be told, he's been merciful to you. Verse 17 should be read along with other verses in chapter 3. Let's go there. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man, Christ, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who had built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Look also at chapter 4, and begin there at verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, 
Let us hold fast our profession. That means to hang on to it tightly. Let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's one of the most comforting verses, the greatest testimonies of the virtue and the purity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was tempted in all points like as we are. That, you know, a man could say, well, Christ wasn't married, so a married man might face certain temptations that, that a single man doesn't. Christ, how can Christ identify with that guy? Well, the Bible doesn't require Christ to have been tempted in all four or five thousand different uh, respects that everybody is tempted in. But in the garden, the woman saw that the tree was good for food, uh, pleasant to the eyes, a tree desired to be one to make one wise, and the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Um, First John tells us these things really are at the root of every temptation. Um, the devil said to the Lord Jesus, command that these stones be made bread. That's the lust of the flesh. Um, and the lust of the eyes. All these kingdoms will I give you if they'll fall down and worship me. And the pride of life. Cast thyself down from the pinnacle of the temple for he has written, he shall send his angels and they shall bear thee up lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Attempt God, test God, prove God, make God defend you, make God protect you, make God spare your life. Uh, that's the pride of life, just to do it because you can. And uh, so Satan tempted the Lord Jesus um, in the same areas that virtually all temptations fall into. The Bible says, uh, well, let's actually go there. We'll conclude with this, and you don't need to turn, but... Yeah, maybe I'm lost. First Corinthians ten, verse thirteen says, There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. You know, whenever you've thought something wrong or said something wrong or done something wrong, there's always that slight little moment when you realize and confess to yourself, I didn't do everything I could have done to escape it. You say, well, I couldn't help myself. Yes, you could have. By the fact that you're admitting I couldn't help myself means you could have. You knew better. And um, he says there in verse, uh, the last part of verse uh, 17, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Reconciliation, that's to bring, uh, bring back together two hostile, two opposing parties. Uh, to establish good relationship between them once again. Go one last text I'll have you turn to is Isaiah 59, the Old Testament, Isaiah 59. That's in the Old Testament, right after Isaiah 58. <laughs> Isaiah 59 says, Behold, the, verses 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered perverseness. And so that's the condition the sinner's in. He is the, the enemy of God. He's hostile to God. His sins have built a wall between him and God. He has no real fellowship with God. But the Lord Jesus Christ came to reconcile those two parties, the man and God, back together again and establish a friendly 
relationship between one and the other once again. And this he did by bearing the judgment of the, of the sinner um, in himself on the cross. He was judged and punished for the sins that the sinner had ever ca carried out or would carry out. And now, uh, on that basis, what the sinner is expected to do, asked to do, is to trust in Jesus Christ. To trust that that's sufficient. And call upon Christ. You might not have the right words. You might not know how to say it. You might not know how to express it. But if you understand that you need Jesus Christ, call out on Him and let Him do the rest. It should be a very, very simple proposition. And yet, by that, Jesus Christ is able to reconcile two uh, opposing parties back together once again. And then back in our, back in our text, verse 18, and we'll finish here. <coughs> For that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. To succor, that's another a word that's not used very often, but it means to aid, to assist, to comfort, like comforting or aiding uh, a wounded soldier on the battlefield. That's to give succor to give aid and comfort and help to someone who uh, needs it. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ does for you and for me.